Welcome viewers to this broadcast of God's Word. Uh, the message today is no big sin or small sin. All sin is sin before God. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful moment you've given to us, Lord, to listen to your word. Lord, I pray that you open our minds to understand your word, soften our hearts to respond to your word. And I pray that you transform our will to obey and apply your word in every area of our lives. Father, we surrender our minds to you. We thank you, our Father and our God, and we honor you. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and believe. Amen. As I have mentioned, uh, we are going to look at the issue of sin. There is no big sin or small sin. All sin is sin before God. And all sin is judged. There is no big sin or a small sin. All sin is sin before God and will cause people not to enter the kingdom of God. Sin will cause you as an individual not to enter the kingdom of God. And all sin is equal before God. And all sin is judged. What we may think is small sin has been put together with what we may think is big sin. What we may uh, just think that it is, you know, a uh, small sin. To God it is not small sin. To God it is sin. And it has been put together with what we may consider to be big sin. So all sin is sin before God. And the portion of scripture that is going to guide us is 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 to 11. And this is what the word of God says. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, or who worship idols, or commit adultery, or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of of God. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's what the Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 to 11. As we have seen, all sins have been put together. Big sin of homosexuality, thieves, prostitutes, drunkards, and those who commit adultery, male prostitutes, and those who worship idols have been put together with those who cheat, those who lie to people, who tell lies. So one might think that a lie is a lesser sin than homosexuality. Yet, all sins have been to put together. Even murderers have been put together. And God has said, those who tell lies, those who do all these kind of vices, none of them will inherit his kingdom. None of them will enter heaven. So don't trivialize sin. No sin is trivial before God. When Apostle Paul was writing this portion of scripture, he was writing it to the Corinthians church. He wrote this letter to the church, telling the Corinthian church and the church of our time that any Christian who fails to change from their former sinful life will not enter the kingdom of God. If you are a Christian and you have not changed, you still live the sinful life that you lived before you received Jesus. Before you received Jesus, you will not enter the kingdom of God because 
Conversion has not taken place in your heart. If truly a person changed, if a truly a person has received Jesus, they will change. Because if that person meant in their heart that they had made their mind to start following Jesus, and they received Jesus, they believed and received Jesus, change is just obvious with such a person. A, a truly, if it truly, if truly a person meant it in their heart to follow Jesus, such a person cannot continue to follow the devil. You will know whether a person is a true Christian or not by the kind of life they live. You don't need to, uh, to look anywhere else. You don't even have to listen to what the person is telling you. You just need to observe them. The disciples of Jesus asked Jesus, Lord, how shall we know the false teachers? How shall we know them? And Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. So it is by our actions that we are known, whether we are followers of Christ or we are followers of the devil. Your actions show whose follower you are. It is not enough to say you are a Christian, but your actions show who, whose followers, whose follower you are. Your actions will show whose follower you are. Those who indulge in sexual sin, or who worship idols, or commit adultery, or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice these things are followers of the devil and will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you have to learn to take God at his word because God is faithful to his word. If he has said that such who practice such vices will not inherit his kingdom, they truly will not inherit his kingdom. It does not matter whether such people are in the church. It does not matter whether such people uh, purport to be serving God. If they practice homosexuality, if they are drunkards, if, if they, are, uh, they cheat people, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. True salvation brings about change. True salvation brings about change. And it does not matter whether a person calls themselves Christians or whatever they call themselves. They will not inherit the kingdom of God if they have not changed. If they remain the same sinful people but they say they are Christians, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Because the moment you receive Jesus, you became a new creation. The old disappeared and the new has come. If you truly receive Jesus, it is usually an inward change that leads to outward transformation. And if at all one received Jesus, change ought to be seen in the life of that person. True salvation brings about change in a person's life as they stop following the devil and begin obeying Jesus. If you find that change has not taken place in a person's life, then the person did not believe and receive Christ in his heart, and therefore no salvation took place. Salvation comes when you believe in your heart and you receive Christ in your heart. John chapter 1 verse 12 tells us that those who believed in him, those who received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. That's how salvation comes about. You have to believe in your heart and you have to receive Christ in your heart. That's how salvation comes about you. And because this is an issue of the heart, that is where conversion takes place, in our hearts, in our hearts. And 
If truly that happened, then change ought to be seen. In your life, how you talk, how you behave, your actions will always give identity of who you are. Whether you're a Christian or whether you're just a Christian by name, but there is no inward conversion. If there is inward conversion, then that person has changed and it will be seen on the outward. People will see it by how you conduct yourself. Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. The people of Antioch looked at them and just outward appearance and their actions and how they spoke and acted, the people of Antioch called them Christians, which means they were acting Christ-like. They were not living sinful lives. And therefore, the people of Antioch were able to identify them as Christians. When people see you who do not know you, do they identify you as a Christian? Can they be able to see Christ in you? Does your attitude, your action, tell who you are? Because if people who do not know you will not be able to see whether you are a Christian or not, it seems you've not give, given them evidence enough to show that you are a Christian. You have not shown them that you are a Christian by how you behave, how you speak, and how you act. We need to be true Christians, Christians who emulate Jesus, people who live in accordance to the word of God so that people will be able to see Christ in us. We are supposed to act the way Jesus would act. We are supposed to emulate the Lord, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, because the same spirit that was in Christ Jesus has been put in us. The Holy Spirit of God is in us, and he is in us as our teacher, and as our guide, and as our comforter. And the word of God that we are supposed to be reading always and applying in every area of our life is God-breathed, as the word of God tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 7, that all scripture is God-breathed and suitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. So, the word of God, we are supposed to allow the word of God to train us. We are supposed to allow the word of God to correct us. We are supposed to allow the word of God to rebuke us. And we are supposed to allow the word of God to teach us in righteousness so that Christ in us may be able to be seen, so that we are able to impact the world for Christ. We are able to attract others who do not know Christ to Christ. So, we are, change is supposed to be seen in us. And brothers and sisters, let me say this. Sin is judged. Whether you are born again, Christian, or not, if you are a Christian who is engaging in sin, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is not for sinners. The kingdom of God is for those who have received, who have believed and received Christ and have allowed transformation to take place upon their lives. Because if you have not allowed transformation to take place in your life, chances are that you will be, you will, because the Holy Spirit is always at work convicting us of sin, whether you are born again or not. And if you are a Christian and the Holy Spirit convicts you, you are engaging in sinful, sinful activities, the Holy Spirit continues convicting you, and you don't yield to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, chances are that you will reach a place where now you will no longer now perceive the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you will end up departing from faith because it is usually a gradual process. But either you will die a premature death because sin is judged as we, as we shall see, or you will end up 
walking out of salvation. With time, you will end up walking out of salvation. Sin is judged. The word of God tells us in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. That is the wages of sin to a Christian and to a non-Christian. If you live a sinful life, you will die a premature death. Whether you are a born-again Christian or you are not born again, the wages of sin is death. Sin is judged by death. So when you, en when you engage in sin, you get yourself entangled with death that is attached to sin. So whether you are a Christian or non-Christian, you need to know that sin is judged. If you're living a sinful life, you'll die a premature death because sin is judged and God's word is immutable. God's word is living and active and shall take effect upon your life. So the onus is upon you. If you are born again, allow yourself to be transformed by God's word and by the Holy Spirit of God. Read God's word every day and apply it in every area of your life. And you will be transformed by the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And when we look at the effect of sin, we will see that the first effect is that you will not enter the kingdom of God. As the portion of scripture we have read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 11 tells us that you will not inherit the kingdom of God if you are living a sinful life. And number two, you will die premature death. There are so many people who are in their graves. And how did they get there? Through sin. Because sin is judged. So you want to, to enter the kingdom of God, it begins by believing and receiving Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior. For as Jesus has said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the truth, the way, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus has said he's the truth, the way, and the life. And no one comes to the Father. And truly no one comes to the Father apart from by believing and receiving Jesus. For it is when you believe and receive Jesus that the blood that he shed on the cross to atone for our sins takes effect upon you as an individual the moment you believe and receive Jesus. The blood that he shed on the cross. Because the word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, that there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And of course, the blood of animals could not pay for our sins. It could, non, it could, could only cover our sins. And our blood, the blood of a sinner, cannot pay for the sins of the sinner. So it took the righteous blood of Jesus, the promised Messiah, to shed his blood on the cross to pay for our sins. And when he hung on that cross, he said, it is finished. What God finished? The work of saving mankind. So that as John 3.16 tells us, that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that Christ has come, has shed his blood on the cross, the honors is upon you and I to use our free will and believe and receive him as the Lord of our lives and personal Savior. And the blood that he shed on the cross to pay for the sins of humanity will take effect upon you as an, as an individual and you'll become born again. Then from there, that is called instant justification. You are justified before God instantly. But then there is what we call progressive sanctification. This change, transformation that takes place. And that is progressive. And you are involved in that. You've got to be available to read God's word every day. And to apply God's word in every area of your life. For you to receive this progressive sanctification. For this change to take place upon your life. So that the kind of sins that have been mentioned here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 to 11 will not be part of your life because of the transformation that will have taken place in your life. And that's why the word of God in closing is telling us here that these are the kind of people we once were. The word of God is telling us that but you are cleansed. Uh, it's telling us here that um, some of you were once like that, 
But you are cleansed. You are made holy. You are made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So this is what some of us were. Drunkards. Homosexuals. Idolaters. Adulteries. Cheats. And all that. But then we were washed. We were cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So we are a new creation. That new creation ought to take effect upon you through being committed to your salvation, reading God's word every day, applying God's word in every area of your life. And God, through his Holy Spirit, will transform you, will change you. For there is no way the Holy Spirit is going to change you without you being obedient to God's word. And you cannot obey God's word that you do not know. So you need to purpose to read God's word. So if you are there and you have never given your life to Christ, it begins by receiving Jesus. After you have received Jesus, then Jesus will change you from inside out. So I'm going to make this prayer. You repeat this prayer after me and you mean it in your heart and Christ will come into your life. He will forgive your sins and he will be the Lord of your life and personal Savior. And you will enter heaven if you will allow God's word to transform you. If you are going to be reading God's word after you have received Jesus and applying it in every area of your life, you will enter the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is a righteous kingdom, for God is righteous himself. And we need to be righteous ourselves. Of course, we receive the righteousness of Christ when we receive Jesus. But then we also need to live a holy life. Because if we live a sinful life, chances of walking away from salvation are there. Because sin hardens our hearts. And sin may, because when you're sinning, what are you doing? You're obeying the devil. Yet, you cannot be a follower of Christ and at the same time be a follower of Satan. You either follow one and you, you fail to follow the other. So you are either a follower of Christ or a follower of Satan. So therefore, know whose followers you are. And whoever you follow, if you follow Satan, you will end up in hell with him. And, but if you follow Jesus, you will be with him in the kingdom of God, in heaven. And there is no following of Christ without believing and receiving him. As the word of God tells us in John chapter 1 verse 12, there you have to believe and you have to receive in order for you to be born again. So therefore I'll lead you in this prayer. You mean it in your heart and Christ will come into your heart. He will forgive your sins and he will be the Lord of your life and personal savior. Let us pray. Repeat this prayer after me and you mean it in your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner and you died for me on the cross this day. I open the door of my heart. I welcome you to come in, forgive my sins, and be the Lord of my life and personal Savior. And write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. If you have made that prayer, you are now a born again Christian. So you need to look for a Bible believing church because you need to belong to a fellowship of other born again Christians. You also need to invest in a Bible. You need to buy a Bible. And you need to start reading uh, the Bible from the Gospel of John. Why the Gospel of John? The Gospel of John tells you who Christ is. And by the time you come to the end of the Gospel of John, you will have known who Christ is. So you begin from the Gospel of John, and you don't read your Bible randomly, you read your Bible systematically. Beginning from the Gospel of John, and after you are through with the Gospel of John, the next book is the book of Acts. As you read the the, the book of Acts, you will see how believers in Christ are filled with the Holy Spirit so that you may desire also to be filled with the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. You will only need to pray and ask Jesus to fill you with the anointing power of the Holy Spirit and he will fill you with the anointing power of the Holy Spirit so that you get the power to tell others about Jesus. You get the power to also lead others to Christ for that is what every born again Christian has been commissioned to do in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, to tell others about Jesus and to make other disciples for Christ. Lead someone to Christ, walk with them, 
and let them get rooted in their faith in Christ. So, so that also, likewise, they can also be able to tell others about Jesus and be able to lead them to Christ and be able also to disciple them. So therefore, after you're through with the, with, the, with the book of Acts, you move on to the next book, to the next book like that, until you come to the last book of the New Testament, which is the book of Revelation. By the time you get to the book of Revelation, you will have known who Christ is, you will have known what salvation is, and therefore you will have understood everything about salvation. So when you come to the book of Revelation, to the end of it, then now you can come to the book of Genesis. And as you read the Old Testament, you should be able to see picture of Christ as you read the Old Testament. For the Old Testament points at the coming Messiah. And the New Testament is the prophetic message that Messiah has come and he is coming again. So as you read the Old Testament, interpret it in light of the revealed truth of God in Christ Jesus. For the word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, that in the days past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken through his son. So as you read the Old Testament, interpret it in light of the revealed truth of God in Christ Jesus. And that way you will be able to get the whole counsel of God's word. You'll be able to have what we call a proper interpretation, correct interpretation of God's word. When you interpret God's word, in light of the revealed truth of God in Christ Jesus. Now, as we have come to the end of today's uh, broadcast of God's word, I also encourage you to also be praying every day and always, always pray, always. Because when you pray, you are communicating with your Father in heaven and Jesus has given you direct access to God. Now you can approach his throne of grace and call you Abba Father. We are entering the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus that we have received the moment we believe and receive Christ. Now until we meet again, may the Lord bless you. Amen.